So in this video, we're going to create an entity class within our web server. And this class will represent each row that we have from our database. We're then going to look at two new dependencies. So we have the MySQL connector and the Spring Data JPA. And these are going to allow us to connect our web server into our database. We're going to create a new REST controller, and this will contain two GET requests, one to get all of the records from our database, and one to get very specific records from our database. We're then going to use this REST controller through our web browser, so we can see end-to-end -end how our web application connects with our database and returns data back to the user. So if I move back over to the application, what I want to create now is a model class that will represent each row within our table. So I'm just going to go back to this store package and I'm going to hit new package and I'm just going to call this model. And within this model, I'm going to create a new Java class called address. And now every time we query our database, we will map each of those rows into an address. So as a result, we'll need to populate some of the variables. So we have the ID, the number, the street, and the postcode. And then I'm going to create a constructor for this class that represent the three variables that we actually want to populate our data with. We won't really be interested in the ID of that address. Uh, that ID is only used for the database purpose and also for obtaining a very specific row from our database. So I just do right click and then generate constructor. I'll select the three variables and then just hit OK. And then down below, I'm just going to apply the getters and setters for these variables. Of course, we can never set that ID because that will be done by a database. So I'm just going to remove that. So before we can tell our Spring application that we want to connect to a database and that we want to store objects from that database, we're going to need to import a few new dependencies within our project. So if I just head over to the pom.xml file and we see that we have the Spring Boot starter web. Now there are two new dependencies that we will require. So first we're going to require the MySQL connector dependency. And essentially that allows our application to create a connection with a database table that is created using MySQL. So let's add the MySQL connector and secondly, we will require the dependency of Spring Boot Starter Data JPA. So now that our application has a connection or is able to create a connection with our database, we will now need a dependency that allows us to use the connection to uh, query our database and to fetch data from our database and also to send requests to our database if we want to update it for any reason. So let's just add that Spring Boot Starter da Data JPA dependency. And with these two new dependencies, our application will now have the tools available to it to connect to our MySQL database. So if we head back into our class called address, we will need to tell this class that it's no longer just a normal standard Java class, but instead it might be used to represent a single row from a database. So if we just mark it with the annotation of entity, and we can see that the entity annotation comes from the persistence class of Java X, and that's come from the Spring Boot Starter Data JPA uh, class that we have. So we can now see that there's a compile error on our address. And if we just look at this, it says add ID attribute. So if we marked our class with the entity annotation, we're saying that it represents an entry from a database. So all entries within a database will need to have an identifier. And of course we have that row or we have that value in our ID. So if I go to our variable called ID and I add an annotation above it called ID, and that also comes from the Java X persistence library, we've now resolved that problem. As we won't actually be assigning the value of our ID, we will need to also tell Spring that this is going to be generated by MySQL and that the strategy will be an identity. So we'll mark the annotation of generated value. And we will add a parameter of strategy and the generation type is identity. So now our application knows that this value is going to be the identity and it's going to be generated by MySQL and it represents each row within our application. So the next step that we will require is to tell our class which table it actually connects to. Now by default it's going to connect to the table that has this exact same name so it's going to be looking for a table called address and if we go back into our table we can see that it's actually called addresses 
So usually, if this class was called addresses, we would be absolutely fine to leave it as it is. However, as the table name differs from the class name, we will need to add a new annotation called at table. And then we will need to specify the name equals addresses. So we specified what the table name will be that this class represents a row from, and that's going to be addresses. We know that it's going to have a value called ID, and this will be the uh, primary key for uh, each row within our table. But then we also have these three variables down below. We have number, street, and also postcode. But the entity class works in a very clever way, whereas just like it does with the class name where it tries to map it to a table name, for each of these variables, it will try to map the number to a variable name called number, the same for street, and the same for postcode. Fortunately, all of our columns within our table correspond exactly to the name of the variable that we provided within this entity class. If, however, within our database table, the, uh, the name of the column for number was actually something like street number, we would add a new annotation called at column, and we would specify that the name is equal to street number. But as the column within our table is actually number, we won't require this annotation for any of our variables. So we've created our table and we've populated it. We now have a class within our application that will map directly to one of these rows. Now we need to connect our application with our MySQL table. And the way we're going to do this is by using the application properties file within our application. So if you head over to main and then resources, and then down below, you'll see application.properties. And within here, we will be providing our application with the key value pairs that are required for it to connect to our MySQL database. So first it needs to know exactly where our application is held. So first it needs to understand where it can find the MySQL database. And if you recall, when we created our connection, we hosted it on port 3306. So we'll have a key called spring data source URL, and that will be equal to JDBC, colon MySQL, colon forward slash, forward slash, and then localhost, 3306, forward slash, my store. And my store is going to be the name of the schema that we defined within our connection. Next, we'll need to provide the username, so spring data source username, and that's equal to root. And then we'll need to provide the password, which is spring data source password. And then I'll leave you to add the password as you require. So with these details, our application will know exactly where our database is hosted, uh, the username for it, and also the password that allows it to connect to it. So now that our application is able to connect to a data store, we will need a class that takes requests from the controller, which is where the user sends their requests, and then transforms it into a quest into the database. And for this, we're going to need a repository layer. So I'm just going to create a new package, and then I'm going to add repository. And very simply, I'm going to create a new Java class, which is an interface, and I'm just going to call this MySQL repository. Now, if I take us back to the pom.xml where we installed the Spring Boot Starter Data JPA dependency, this provides us with a lot of tools that are out of the box that allow us to query our MySQL database. And actually, if we just take our interface and we extend the JPA repository, we will need to provide two types into this interface. First will be the class that each row within our application maps to. So for us, this will be the address. And the second argument will be the type that our identifier value is going to be. So we know that our ID is an integer. I'm just going to import that JPA repository. And by just extending this one class from the JPA package, our MySQL repository will provide all of the out of the box tools that are required for our application to make very simple requests to our MySQL database. So we created our table. We've then created a class that maps to each row within that table. We've then provided the resources that allow our application to connect to that table. And we have a class within the repository layer that will be used for querying that table. The missing piece is the controller class.
So at the moment, we have our test controller. And I'm just going to create a new controller, which is used for our store. So I'll do new Java class, and I would do store controller. And because we're going to be making RESTful queries, I will need to annotate it with REST controller. And now we can start to add some endpoints that connect with our MySQL repository, which will then allow us to query the MySQL database. So to start, I'm going to auto-wire the MySQL repository into our controller. So when we start our application, this means the store controller, we'll have access to the MySQL repository interface and all of the methods that come with the JPA repository class. And now we're going to use our MySQL repository to query our database. So if I create a new get mapping, and let's say we just want to return all of the values that we have within our database, I'm going to mark this with the endpoint of get all addresses. And because we're returning a list of addresses, this is what the return type will be for this method. So we'll do list and then address. To obtain all of the addresses, we're now going to use the MySQL repository. And now if I hit dot, we can now see all of the methods that our repository can perform thanks to the extension of the JPA repository. So once again, you can see that we can delete entities. We can delete all, we can delete by ID, we can find all, we can find all by ID. And there are many other methods that we will explore in a later video. But for this one, all we want to do is return find all. And because in our MySQL repository, we've told them that the very first argument is address. So that means every row that we return from our MySQL database is going to be an address. So it knows that it's going to be returning a list of address items to us. And I can just do return. And now we have our endpoint for get all addresses. So now if I just run this application, we can see it's hosted on port 8080. I'm just going to take this endpoint from our get mapping. And if I go to the endpoint of get all addresses, we can now see each row from our database table has been mapped into a JSON object. So each row will be represented by a single item. And we can see that the first has an ID of one, the number 742, and then we have evergreen terrace and then SP1. And then we have the same for ID two and then ID three. So we've successfully created an endpoint for obtaining all the records from our database table. And to conclude this video, we're just going to create one more endpoint. However, the difference will be to just return a single item from our database table. And to identify each row within our table, we're going to use this ID value of one, two, or three. And we're going to pass it into our URL to specify exactly which row from that table we would like to obtain. So if we create a new get mapping, and I'm going to add a new forward slash, and within curly brace, I'm going to call a string called ID. And this endpoint is going to return just a single address to us, so public address. And what we're going to do is return MySQL repository, and we will use find by ID. The only problem we have here is that the find by ID requires us to pass in an integer. So I'm just going to call this integer ID, and then I'm going to call get as it returns an optional to us. So our next challenge here is to take the ID that we're passing within the URL and to pass it into our function here where we've defined find by ID. And we're going to do this by using the annotation of path variable within our method. So if we put an annotation and then path variable, and within that path variable, we specify exactly what we've defined in the variable slightly above. So within the curly braces, we put ID. So within speech marks, I'm just going to put ID. And then I'm going to define what that variable would be mapping into. And I'm going to call that an integer of ID. So if this variable was called identity, I would then just change this path variable to identity. And then I'm mapping it to an object of an integer and I'm calling that ID. And then I'm using the JPA repository method called find by ID and passing in that ID and then I'm returning get. So if I restart our application, we'll have a new endpoint called get address. And then it's also expecting a value after the first forward slash of identity. And that will be the ID that we're expecting to return. So I've changed the URL at the top to get dash address. Then if I just put the number one, we can now see that the ID of one has been returned to us in a JSON format. 
And then if I change this to ID2, we have two. And then if I change this to ID3, we have three. So that concludes this video where we've transformed our application, a standalone web server. We've created our MySQL database, and then we've defined an entity class within our application that will map each row from our table into the application. We've then extended the JPA repository with a new interface, which allows us to use the connection that we've built with MySQL database to actually perform queries upon it. We've told JPA repository that each row represents an address and that the ID is going to be of type integer. And then we've created a brand new REST controller and we've got two endpoints. One is for getting all the addresses and we're using that MySQL repository to find all. And then just a single address where we're using a path variable uh, on the variable of identity and we're mapping that into an ID. And then we're passing that into find by ID from MySQL repository to return that address back to the user. And then finally, we've tested this all within the browser so we can see how these two get mappings are working with our application. Now in the last video that will be coming up next, we're going to take our store controller class to the next level by allowing it to post uh, uh, addresses into the application. We're also going to be able to put addresses, so we're going to be able to update, and we're also going to be able to delete from our MySQL database and through the REST controller.